<laughs> I'm hedging my bets if I already got the winner. For this. Uh, look deliberative. <laughs> and one minute has elapsed. <laughs> no, but I wanted—I didn't want to interrupt the actual. <laughs> this was yours. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. And I have that back. Okay. The presenting team now will have ten minutes to respond to the question. Everybody looked deliberative for a minute. When you're ready. Okay. Okay. Thank you, moderator. So, <laughs> I'm going to give you the answer right away because I think that's the easiest. We're going to say no. We we value the the traditional indigenous people in this case. I'm going to give you three reasons for or three considerations which will be talked touched on by each of us following with, with a conclusion to follow. The first is we're going to talk about knowledge because after all, you have to ask yourself who knows best how to handle this resource. We're going to talk about scientific and traditional knowledge. Second, we're going to talk about letting people manage something and how that empowers them. And then third, we're going to give considerations to the animal. Uh, do they have rights? Those kinds of questions. And also to the environment at large. So I'm going to open up sure. the, the discussion about the scientific just versus traditional it. knowledge. It's on. Push the button. And I just want to get this out because we need to undercut a lot of presumption. There's presumption the that scientific off. knowledge or Western knowledge uh, is the best or the preferred or can stand alone in the management of endangered species. And what we see being Alaskans is largely this isn't true. When you look at the North Slope and you look at the Inuit people who live on the North Slope, their knowledge of the bowhead whales goes back 10, 12,000 years. They have been living um, largely exclusively off the bowhead whales for parts of the, parts of the season uh, for thousands and thousands of years. They know the migratory patterns. Patterns. They have a type of knowledge of that whale, which a, a scientist who studies it in Southern California just doesn't have um, different, not necessarily worse. So we don't, we're not discrediting scientific knowledge. We're just saying scientific knowledge is not complete. Western scientific knowledge is not complete. They, these things haven't been studied as long. Uh, the species isn't as well known. Um, it's not as well known from a ground uh, level, but more from an observer's status. And so we really value traditional knowledge in managing species because when we look at groups like the Alaskan Natives, we see that they manage their species incredibly well because they have a long tradition of managing these species. The species are very important to them, and that'll lead into my partner's point. Before I do, I just want to clarify. So, traditional knowledge can't replace scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge can't fully replace traditional knowledge. The two need to work hand in hand. But we need to undercut the presumption that the government of Brazil knows more than these people do how to manage the species. We'd say that it's at least on par. Uh, the traditional knowledge is at least on par, perhaps even better, because it's from a more of a ground level. So on the second, the second point that really extends this is that how we uh, let the indigenous people in this instance uh, manage and how this empowers them and empowers their culture in managing these dolphins. So we see that the primary stakeholders in this case, as far as like, uh, people are concerned, the primary stakeholders are the indigenous people. The indigenous people have the cultural attachment to these Pink River dolphins. The indigenous people um, are the ones most invented in the persistence because the dolphin is now invested in their culture, the persistence of their culture, with this dolphin being iconic uh, symbol in, in lots of their folklore and their, and their mythology and being um, important for ceremonial purposes and things like that, is that they, their fates are bound together. And that when we allow the survival of this uh, culture to maintain their practices, is that these are also the ones building on who have the best knowledge and experience with these rivers, with these dolphins. They've been doing it since forever. And what we give them more ability, put more control into the survival of their culture and their practices into the hands of the indigenous people, and we take less of that uh, potential abuse on the behalf of the Brazilian government out of their hands. So what we're really doing is empowering people to uh, have their culture go on and be strengthened. Uh, also, um, considering that 15% of the world's population are indigenous people, um, globalization is taking its toll. And what we are, what we have here, is a potential loss for cultural diversity. Um, due to this, due to empowering the people, what we are essentially doing is empowering the the survivalment of that particular culture and their beliefs. Uh, in a world where global, where everyone's like automaton, just doing the same thing, it's. It, it's a bland, and there's a loss for ideas. Cultural diversity is essential to uh, the humanity. The humanity. When we've seen historically that when we side on the deference of these indigenous communities, we've seen great things uh, come out of that. 
we've seen cultures preserved and peoples uh, being treated fairly equally. Historically, whenever we side on the deference of the state to go against the wills and the wishes of these cultures and these people, we've seen people marginalized, people hurt, and then actions taken that you can't truly take back. Yeah, rarely, if ever, do we see, we have a lot of experience in Alaska of native populations who subsist on charismatic megafauna like different types of whales and endangered species. And rarely, if ever, is it the fault of those native groups and their traditional hunting practices uh, that is the cause of the population decline. And so if we're looking to meaningfully address the cause of the population uh, decline in these particular instances of the dolphins, and we're looking to avoid extinction because of these dolphins, we would want to be looking at the factors which have led other than the indigenous populations taking of these dolphins to their decline and look to address those factors uh, because although we don't know a lot about this particular instance, we think it's very unlikely that a tradition that has sustained itself for thousands of years would suddenly be the cause of the massive population decline. And so we see that, as John was saying also, that there exists a wealth of knowledge that we don't want lost associated with these populations. There are some areas in which Western scientific knowledge of different species and different populations, migration patterns, things like that, exceeds native understanding and traditional understanding of those populations. But there's many areas in which the native understanding of the populations, insofar as it relates to the human interaction, uh, greatly surpasses the knowledge uh, and the current knowledge of the Western scientific world. And so if we have a stronger native cultural institution and we allow for the types of people, the types of traditional wisdom that has persisted through generations uh, to still exist and to be maintained and to be replenished uh, through traditional activities such as harvesting of dolphins uh, and harvesting of other types of large sea mammals, uh, we see that information is more likely to continue on in future generations and be useful. We'll also see a lot less rule breaking associated with the native groups. Where native groups have been disenfranchised here in our home state of Alaska, uh, we've seen that they still engage in the types of hunting activities because oftentimes they're the only ones there and the ability of you know, regulators and enforcement uh, to come in and stop them is very limited. Uh, but when they're disenfranchised from the decision making process, they're more likely to act outside of what uh, they could be gained from Western traditional knowledge. And we're more likely to lose, as a part of our Western traditional knowledge, uh, you know, the population understanding that, that they have. And so I'm going to address, I'm going to address some of potential outcomes, and as well as clarify some of the harms that we that we heard. And I really want to emphasize that we are uh, looking at this from the perspective of the human being. Uh, as far as the the rights that possibly could be fall the dolphins as far as the rights of, of the environment. Uh, intimidating to be uh, with an expert in that field, but we would feel like we believe that we can achieve both a popula healthy population of dolphins and this traditional way of life. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the possibilities. So we go in this discussion, and when Wiley says that when you look at where endangered species that indigenous populations rely on have suffered, it's either because of uh, climate change or it's because of, of, of a predatory hunting of it, basically, West, uh, over hunting of it, usually by Westerners, or usually by non-natives. And when we consider that, we consider the position of these indigenous people, uh, we really think that the state, if anybody, has the responsibility to, to maintain a healthy animal population, but not at the expense of making it legal to the indigenous people. Because if the outcome is that the indigenous people completely and irresponsibly handle this, these dolphins and, and, and they are wiped out, then we say, as Matt said, that that was in their hands, that was under their management. But we don't believe that has to be the case, because here's where Western scientific knowledge can come into play. We believe that you can you can put efforts to protect some of the species, to, to breeding efforts, to breed more of the species, to increase the species, to, to make sure that there's not illegal hunting by non-indigenous people, or to make sure that the indigenous hunting is done in a regulated, regulated way. Because right now, the consequence of hunting one of these animals is four years in prison. So we're not, it's not that some natives are being able to hunt them, no natives are being able to hunt them, and we think that you can have management and you can still have these, these you can still avoid these harms. These are more harms, once again, were a loss of culture for the individuals. There was a, a paternalism where uh, unfairly someone's being deprived of their own autonomy over an issue that really concerns them. You have a loss of culture on the global stage, as was mentioned earlier, and so, uh, and also and a lot of the warrant internally, just to roll off John here, in Brazil, the warrant for maintaining this population of dolphins is not just ecological diversity, but it's the traditional value that holds the people within Brazil. 
And so we think that the stakeholders which are most relevantly affected by that are the native population. So giving them the control of the population is best. Uh, but then also, to parse down a little bit the value that we put on the dolphins, we recognize it as individual subjects of a life who are sentient beings and highly intelligent relative to most of the animal populations. Uh, they do have value. What we choose to value over each individual subject of a life in the instance of the dolphins, though, is a healthy and sustained population. And we think that maintaining the type of traditional population knowledge that these native people have by allowing them to maintain their culture and allow them to maintain their tradition and cultural institutions will actually do more to benefit the healthy population of dolphins in the long run, even if for the individual subject of a life it is painful to be hunted uh, you know, by the native group. Comment team now has one minute to confer before offering a five-minute commentary on the presentation. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that the proposition has uh, fundamentally misunderstood what the way that these people, these indigenous people, uh, sir, uh, depend upon the dolphins for survival. We'll clarify it for you a little bit, and then I'll talk about why this idea of environmentalism, why this idea of the idea of an of a, a entire species going extinct it, it, is not something that, there is something that outweighs their values that they've laid out. So they've come up and they've said that primarily this is a fundamentally a cultural uh, uh, value for these people in particular. Um, but you have to understand that it isn't actually a cultural value for them. We are not talking about a group of Alaska natives that have survived off of these dolphins for thousands of years in the same way and eat huge part portions of the dolphins that they catch. Ultimately, they, they just started killing these dolphins in the last 20 years or so. This hasn't been a tradition that's been enshrined in their culture. They do it primarily for financial reasons. That is the, one of the sole reasons they depend upon these dolphins. That's what the motion is suggesting. The, the way that they uh, they do this, and, that, and, and you can see because they don't actually um, eat most of the dolphins that they catch, they actually send it mostly to international sales. They use it as bait to catch fish that they send to international markets that they use to make money, essentially. That is the sole reason that they use these dolphins. We'll show you why there are alternatives available and why that is completely unjustified. Um, so. Like I said, that most of the people in, in this area don't actually have any kind of cultural connection to these particular dolphins. Most of them have no idea that the dolphins are actually being killed in this way. Um, and they, the, several of them have said that like we would, we would reject that, we would stop doing that if we had known. Um, that many of, of, of the fishermen uh, that are actually involved in this practice don't do this for any kind of moral reason or any sacred reason that's connected with their culture. Many of them see the dolphins as competitors for uh, or rivals for fisher for fishing, and they'll kill the dolphins as they've said many times just for fun, just to do it, just because they want to uh, uh, stop the dolphins and they don't like dolphins. Um, they've said that they've had a, they have a slight attachment to the dolphins through like myths and stories and things like that. But ultimately, we, they would lose all of that. They would lose the small amount of cultural connection that they do have to the dolphins if the dolphins die out, which is looking very likely in, in the next few years. They, they depend on them slightly for livelihood, but if they're going to wipe out the dolphins, they're going to lose that livelihood. We think that in that case, when a people are killing the very source of their own li livelihood, paternalism is justified, especially when you have alternatives available, like pig meat, that they can use as bait that works just as effectively as dolphin meat. Um, so in terms of the environmental impacts, this is already illegal in Brazil. In fact, in Brazil, environmental rights are enshrined in their very constitution. It was enshrined from the very beginning of their nation that they should have a value to protect not only environmental rights, but also the rights of animals that to reside in their nation. We would say the collective value to that nation, the collective uh, value to the entire world of biodiversity, of the practical be benefits of not letting a, a species go extinct, outweighs the tiny small group of fishermen that are going to be affected uh, by one, not having a huge uh, cultural attachment to this, uh, the dolphins anyway that they're going to lose, and two, they, depend, they don't depend solely on the dolphins for financial reasons because there are, are alternatives available. To talk more about like why uh, extinction is a bad thing, why we value animal rights, go ahead. You have two options in this scenario. 
first you have the option in which these dolphins are used for their cultural and traditional value, and you know the stories about these dolphins are what's considered most important, and the tradition that has resulted living near these dolphins is valued. The second option is where you hunt these dolphins for profit. And so I'm just going to read to you a quick quote from the article here that we actually have. It says that indigenous, fish, indigenous fishermen kill pink river dolphins for profit. They use the dolphin's meat as bait to catch fish. They sell to customers outside of their community. They sell the dolphin's genitals as good luck charms. And they use oil from their fat as treatment for rheumatism. This is completely different, as Andrew brought to you, from this idea of Alaskans subsistence living off, you know, megafauna, as widely said. Completely different altogether. So either you have a world in which, one, you have the option of preserving that culture by respecting these dolphins and by respecting the addition that they make to that native culture, or you have a world in which people hunt these dolphins for profit, primarily, and have complete disregard for the well-being of these species. We think we want to live in the first world, not the second world. So when we recognize that your, your knowledge claims, even if they are valid, fall flat in the face based on the fact that these are not like actual traditional uh, societies in relation to these dolphins, and that your empowerment issues, again, clearly, when they're killing for fun, they're not being empowered for good things, and when uh, uh, Brazil actually values their environment, uh, as so much so to enshrine their constitution, we think that you have to deal with these issues uh, in your frame. Okay. Presenters now have a minute to confer before their five minute response.
breeding program for these dolphins. We don't think that's going to happen. We value the culture of diversity. You uh, sacrifice it without even mentioning that you're sacrificing it. And even if this was simply, which it's not, it is traditional, if it was simply a, pro a profitable venture, if it was simply something that was enabling them to live their other traditional lifestyle, we would say that it'd be worth it. It'd be something similar to Alaska natives having claim to subsurface oil. Having claim to subsurface oil has done a lot to help empower Alaska natives to live their traditional lifestyle. Was oil a part of their traditional lifestyle? No, but it has empowered them to make, keep that traditional lifestyle. We believe this is the same instance in this case, at worst, at best, which is in fact the reality, it's also traditional, and this way we preserve uh, cultural diversity. And I think that if we're going to try and pass a good government policy, there's some principles that we need to take into consideration with this uh, pluralistic culture is that each of these issues, we need to consider the stakeholders. We need to balance everybody's uh, different rights, their different end games, their desires of what they want to be about the society that they want to have. And then we want to have laws that are narrowly tailored that do just enough without overriding people's rights. We want to have laws that help build into a empowering, uh, empowering society for people to live in. But we think that in this, uh, this idea of passing these laws is that the law that Brazil has passed is not narrowly tailored. It goes right over and above and through the rights of the indigenous people and is therefore wrong. And I think that it's high time that uh, people stop excluding native populations from the discussions, from being the integral part of how they're passing policy on these things that are, as we already said, so primarily close to them and close to their, uh, their lifestyle persistence. Also, with the fact, with considering the fact that uh, both both the Western, uh, both the government and the and the uh, and the cultural knowledge, um, we we both we advocate that the, both the government and the and the native people could work hand in hand to help a both preserve the uh, preserve the cultural traditional values and b preserve the picked off uh, the picked out the population. And through this, we it's a win-win situation. What you guys are advocating for is a nearly one-sided advocation, saying that. Bio diversity has trumped over cultural, human cultural diversity. Okay. So we'll now begin the 10 minute question period, and Dr. Jameson, we'll start with you. Okay, so once again, there's two areas that I'd like to uh, put a little pressure on. So, uh, so basically, what you're advocating is that uh, a fraction of the Brazilian population, namely, uh, Fraction that consists at least of some native peoples, presumably not all native peoples, right? Native peoples from other places, indigenous peoples from this. Essentially, uh, you're arguing that they should have an immunity against the provision of Brazilian environmental law in this case. It's the one who imposed the law, presumably for other people. So, my question is how absolute. Um, so here we have a case that whatever else the facts are, it involves um, it involves an, uh, an endangered species. It involves the use of these species in profit making and not just subsistence activities. And it also involves the killing of these native species for reasons, for some grounds that we, um, however much you want to obey the between indigenous knowledge and science, the idea that the genitals of endangered species actually you know, make rainfall. I mean, I mean we have, you know, science means anything. It could be reason that that's not true. And so, um, so those are the facts in this case. So, and in this case, you want to grant an immunity. What would uh, a fact set have to look like? Is there a fact set that would lead them to the conclusion that there should be no immunity? To Well, look, if in a national park in the United States you have a problem with your deer population and you have a suffering deer population that you want to see increased, one answer is to kill all the wolves um, because wolves do kill deer and if you have fewer wolves then you'll probably have more deer. Uh, but that's probably not the best long-term solution because wolves have been around as a healthy part of that ecosystem for thousands of years and if you see new pressure on the deer population, although wolves killing wolves might solve that problem in the short term, uh, unless there's some extra reason why wolves are suddenly more abundant than they were before, that's probably not the right way to go about it. So in the instance of these dolphins and the Brazilian natives, uh, these 
natives have been killing the dolphins as a healthy part of the ecosystem for, as the article points out, millennia. That might be a bit of a stretch, but a very long time. And so with this new pressure that we see on the dolphin population, it's probably not the right answer to go ahead and restrict the activity that has been a healthy part of the system for a long time. Now, where we would want to restrict that activity is where it's moving beyond uh, what it has been traditionally. So we see the uh, influence of some amount of finance associated with this article, where some amount of the parts and some amount of the charms are sold on the market. And native people are you know, subject to all the same flaws of humanity. If they're seeing an opportunity for extra financial gain and they begin taking the populations in a way that is not consistent with traditional practices, just like many other groups of people would do, then that's a time when we would want to regulate that, and a time when the Brazilian government should go ahead and step in and regulate that. Uh, but within the healthy amount of taking that sustains that traditional knowledge and sustains that traditional institution, we think that we should encourage it and absolutely not try to stop it. So you may just have different factual, yeah, I mean, the differences between the two of you and your factual. If they're, I mean, if, I don't know what the market share would have to be, 10%, 50%, 90%. But if the, if the numbers of takings that's being done for market purposes that achieves a certain level, which they may believe is already exceeded, then you would actually agree that they should have some result in the market. Is that right? Well, for, I'm going to say is that uh, there can be regulations on like numbers or amounts given a certain like, depth of need and not an outright uh, denial. And I think it's also worth saying that, as we've already discussed by the opening of the question, this is a very small population. And this is a very small population that's been able to um, live with and alongside these dolphins for this breadth of time. It's probably not this really small population that's causing the sharp decline. They're not really going to focus on. Like any other population that, of uh, species population that you're managing, you know, you'd be cast a wary eye if a bunch of it was being exported out for some kind of thing. The important thing, I guess, where if you want to like a line in the sand, we would want guaranteed harvest. So the numbers may be different. The management preferably would be uh, mixed between indigenous and the government, because we see largely that a paternalistic approach by the government, excluding the indigenous population, causes these problems, often causes a, a species extinction. And so, uh, but we would want a guaranteed harvest because we're concerned with culture. Remember, the ultimate clash is biodiversity and cultural diversity. And we're concerned with cultural diversity. We support cultural diversity. And even taking half of the traditional amount of whale or of, of dolphins taken. It's still preserving that tradition. Okay, well my second question is, um, is I thought it was interesting that when you talked about the primary stakeholders, you didn't mention the dolphins. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, maybe, so what would you say to someone who just said that begs the question? You <laughs> disagree with the person who would say we, we, did, we, did, we did mention it a little bit. Uh, the, the dolphins are individual subjects of a life that are worthy of some yeah. amount of moral consideration. It didn't seem to count for much. You know, it didn't mean <laughs> to be stakeholders. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. Um, because, you know, in sort of the framework that we were going on, we took a paternalistic approach where the overall health of the dolphin population in the long term was probably <coughs> more important uh, than each individual life, which could be subject to all sorts of painful and harmful ends and you know deaths uh, within the wild. And we also feel like humans uh, and the healthy, happy, traditional human life is more important. And so we value the overall population relative to the individuals. But to yeah, also, uh, we, we also need to take the fact that we are animals as well. We, we seem to, uh, we, we have basic tendencies to like hunt and eat uh, to hunt uh, animals for food. That's basically, that's a state, that's a, that's a nature, that's just like the basic nature of things. Um, the animal, I'm pretty sure the lion hunting the animal that does not care. I mean, for, for the, uh, for the, for, for the, uh, the outcome of the uh, antelope, but the fact is that we are, we are, we are two animals, and to, to, to put us on like a higher level, or, oh no, I, I'm saying we are on the same level as any other animal. So, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, so also, when I was talking about primary stakeholders, and I was talking about the primary human stakeholders, I didn't need to emphasize the dolphins. I uh, probably wouldn't have good to do it more, but something else I was bringing up is about how linked the two are, the indigenous culture being linked with the survival of the dolphin, survival of the dolphin linked with the indigenous culture, and likewise where um, if perhaps the dolphin's death 
is so like imminent, like there's three of them left and the government can step in and have a regulation like we've talked about with that, uh, like regulation to a certain threshold. So likewise where that could be um, taken, also we see that dolphins, uh, some of their number, fewer, like some of their number can be sacrificed for a greater benefit of a regulation of a whole and have them together. So I did address um, that culture as the primary stakeholder, but also links together. But your question would demand, uh, or would beg actually, in fact, uh, a justification for human rights and then animal rights and possibly a distinction between the two. I feel like I just don't have the time to do that, especially in a room full of philosophy professors. I mean, obviously, the discussion, <laughs> the discussion of human rights, natural rights, vast and, and, and a very lengthy discussion, then you'd end up with different uh, views anyway. But the point is, at least human being as a, as a species, though some individuals can't, Human beings as a species can stand up and say, I have rights, I demand rights, I ought to have rights, uh, something to this extent. They can even come up with a concept of rights. Um, and uh, animal species or dolphins uh, not being able to explicit that ability, I don't think we can look at them and say, you have rights on the same level as us. So when we're considering what's best for the dolphins, we're not going to go ask the dolphins, but we're going to ask uh, humans and the various human actors that Matt brought up what's best for the dolphins, and in the same way you'd have to do that with a small child who couldn't take care of itself, right? And, and, and so far as the dolphins have capacity for feeling pain and have the capacity to build relationships between each other, uh, we think they deserve respect, but we don't take the full Tom Reagan stance where we think that because of the decreased intellectual capacity that dolphins have, they don't have the same autonomy just inherently to go ahead and pursue meaningful projects over the course of their life, and we don't think that ending their life, if done so in a relatively humane way, or as a humane way as possible, really has the same moral significance that you know decreasing the value of a human life would if they're not you know if in this case indigenous populations are not able to fulfill themselves uh, in a meaningful way because they're not allowed to practice their traditional you know beliefs. Thirty seconds. Yeah, we could. I don't think we have time. Is it? How would you define a cultural taking uh, in the methods? Are they allowed to use motorboats? We certainly didn't use motorboats a hundred years ago. So is is that is that uh, you know does that help preserve the cultural ability if they're not doing it in in, in the historical cultural methods? Well, what we want to do is ultimately what we talk about is empowering that culture to have control over their progression, like their rights and their continuance. If they feel that the boat, whatever form of boat best fits that, we give deference to them, not deference to this other government. Thank both teams for making it to the final round. Which is well, we'll give Dr. Jameson a moment or two to gather his thoughts, and then uh, if uh, the teams want to cross the floor and congratulate each other, you're more than welcome to. But we've asked Dr. Jameson to uh, not just score and call the round, but if he would provide some comment and critique to the teams, I think that would be valuable as well. So whenever he feels like he's ready to proceed. Yeah, yeah, let's go. They're not too shabby. There's some You're going to find that on the debate team. Gentlemen, back here. Can you take your seats, please? Let me. Ah. Thank you. Just like a room full of philosophy professors tends to, time tends to dissolve. So I think my thoughts may be ungatherable on the time frame that any of us are interested in at this point. But um, but so let me make let me make some comments first in general. Uh, then let me make some specific comments about each of the cases, and uh, and then let me open the envelope. Right. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, I mean, um, I thought that both teams were very articulate. Um, um, quick on your feet, able to respond well. Obviously, there were cases where there was some lack of engagement and some question begging, but, um, but that's the sort of thing that happens when people have three years to contemplate questions as well. So I thought you all did a good job on that. Um, I thought you were good about, I thought both teams were good at uh, remaining anchored the cases. Now I'm going to give you some exceptions to that. Most part of that, you were both good at that, and you were good at sort of calling out the other side and then putting in to the part of the questionable assumptions that weren't stipulated. Um, 
I also thought that um, that both teams, um, but probably especially your team, had pretty systematic views in both cases that were being presented. Um, and it's always a difficult balance to know how much of that hand can and should be shown in this, this kind of a format. But I thought it was impressive that, uh, that there was that, that kind of depth. Um, I think sometimes, if, if I may say this, that the confidence and the quickness can be a little too much. Uh, because these are difficult questions. And I think um, a, a little more acknowledgement on both sides of the difficulty of the questions, <laughs> <laughs> the grayness of the colors, and the possibility that the other side might actually have raised a difficult point. Um, would, have, would have been harder. They're all debaters. Uh, and I do recognize that the role modeling is kind of ambiguity is not really all one would like these days. Um, so, um, then to make some more specific comments, um, first uh, addressed to, um, to NA. Um, so, well, or at least let, let, let's just say about the first case. Um, I mean, I actually thought that you didn't really present the strongest case in the way that you had. Uh, I mean, I thought that you stumbled on this implicit, explicit denial of service, and, and in a way you were sort of arguing a point that was much stronger. Um, and I also thought you got in a little bit of trouble about the grounds for discrimination and the way gave them kind of at least a good rhetorical quote and probably, probably more than that. I actually thought the strongest or at least the most interesting argument that you had, which, which kept you know, popping out but I didn't find it so clearly developed, was this one about the doctor-patient relationship uh, and, and, and sort of the idea that there's a kind of professional ethics that doctors have that actually um, comes under threat, even when doctors are behaving in ways that are consistent with certain non-professional systems of rights that we all have as citizens. And again, that kept popping up, but that wasn't really the focus of your argument. And I thought that the case would have been stronger if, um, if you would have heard that argument um, on the table in a more systematic way. Um, now, I thought, on, uh, on your side, I thought it was very clever uh, to suggest that all the doctor was doing was revealing his biases uh, you know, in a way that might actually sort of improve the kind of match between patients and doctors. Unfortunately, it's entirely unbelievable to me from the case. <laughs> but nevertheless, I thought it was you know, a clever suggestion. Um, I thought that you had a very good comeback on, you know, that once they gave you the legitimacy of economic discrimination, you know, that you had a very good comeback on that. In general, I didn't think that you engaged as strongly with their argument as you should have, especially given how vulnerable <laughs> their arguments were. <laughs> uh, now, with respect to the last case, um, the second case, I thought, um, you know, so I, I actually thought, you know, that you said a lot of things that were true and uplifting, um, but that you tended to evade the, the really central question, which was essentially about a, a very limited exclusion under environmental law uh, in the Missouri context. So I felt the stuff about, you know, I, I mean, it's not that it's not worth making points about the relation between Western science and knowledge, but in a way, that isn't really at the heart of this conversation. This is, this is a much narrow issue about, a very difficult narrow issue about the management of endangered species. And people can agree about all the stuff about indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge. It's still turned out on very different sides than that. And I also thought there was this tendency to, I mean, and again, these are, um, 
these are tendencies that any of us would probably have if we had to try to make this case. But there was this tendency to kind of want to wish the difficulty away, and to, and to talk about and to talk about win-win solutions and and, and so on. Um, and uh, you know, and the fact of the matter is, um, you know, you've got these indigenous people in this indigenous culture, and you've got the species that's on the way to becoming the same. And there's not much way around that more of them being killed rather than less of them being killed is not helping. You know, I mean, you, I mean, there may be reasons to grant the exclusion in this in this case, but this is not on the way to a win-win solution, just given the way the case is, is set up. And so, you know, and so I was a little disappointed that you didn't just, you know, acknowledge the difficulty of it, and that there was going to be a trade-off here. That's going to now, I'm not saying we didn't do that at all, but I felt like a lot of the time went, you know, to talking about the larger issues uh, in, in a way that was fairly big and basic. I, I thought you did a good job of at least getting the, the discussion uh, going um, about indigenous uses and the limits of indigenous uses, um, although, again, I thought you could have done it in a sharper way. So, on the whole, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a very tough call uh, between the two teams. And, uh, and if, you know, at the end of the day, the way I'm going to decide it may be a function. I mean, what may have driven the final decision is which, you know, which sides and which cases you decided to defend and how difficult that turned out to be. But at the end of the day, you're the winners. <laughs> Thank you all very much, and thank you particularly to Dr. Jamison for your comments. And the Dale would be willing to give Team NA <laughs> famed <laughs> Al of Minerva. And it says name like of the same Like a solo volunteer. We'll carve that into the trophy. You would have been a name of the NA. Oh, let's do that again. I got that. Uh, Aww. All right. Remember last year when Elijah wouldn't give up the trophy? He had like a death grab for the entire time. He wouldn't let anyone else touch it.